They've come to symbolize the anguish of the BP oil spill disaster. Oil-covered pelicans, bewildered and helpless as rescuers desperately try to clean them up. But now there's hopefully a happy ending for dozens of these animals. Oil-free and nursed back to health, they've just been released into the sparkling waters of a wildlife refuge. They started a, a new lease on life today. The release is run like a military operation. Giant Coast Guard transport planes carry 62 pelicans from a rehab center in Louisiana to an airport in Texas. The birds are then loaded into vans and taken to the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge near Corpus Christi. At the shoreline, the cages, each containing two birds, are carefully opened by fish and wildlife staffers and other helpers. The birds flap their wings for a second, getting their bearings, then make the most of their newfound freedom in the pristine waters. They're 400 miles from the disaster and a world away from their previous condition. They get a second chance at life and a new place to live. It's a good place for them. These dogs are among the smallest victims of the Gulf oil disaster. They've been turned into Louisiana area animal shelters because many of their owners are out of work fishermen who can no longer afford to keep them. What they're having to do is choose between their families and their pets, whether to feed their kids or feed their pets. Louisiana shelters are overflowing with abandoned pets. The dogs who are not adopted are often euthanized. The numbers are staggering. In June alone, one Louisiana shelter took in 200 170 animals, 179 were put to sleep. <laughs> but these are the lucky ones. They're getting a second chance. 26 dogs were loaded onto this air-conditioned truck bound for Houston. Once the gate is pulled down and the latch is locked in place, the five-hour drive begins. At the Houston SBCA, staff and volunteers unload all the pooches. Each dog is examined. They all get a pill to prevent worms and an anti-flea injection. <laughs> At the kennel, Remington is given a bowl of water and just like that is ready for adoption. When I saw all these dogs come in. It just made me so sad. And Mary Oliarm has taken a liking to the sad-eyed golden retriever. They've been through so much to lose their family and they're traveling here and they're in a strange environment and hopefully I can give them as much as their family gave them before. You would never guess in a million or should we say 27 billion years that this bicycle repairman is the long-lost biological father of Jeff Bezos founder of Amazon.com, the man who changed the way we shop. Look at 69-year-old Ted Jorgensen side by side with Bezos. They even share the same laugh. <laughs> Until recently, Jorgensen had never even heard of Amazon. He doesn't even use a computer. Jorgensen says he still remembers the very last time he saw his son. I was working in a Walmart and I remember them coming to visit me for some reason. It was cold and he had his little winter coat on and I just remember him walking down the aisle coming to see me. Jeff Bezos's mother, Jackie, and Jorgensen were teenagers when they got married in 1963. Back then, Jorgensen was a poor circus performer. Their son, Jeff, was born in 1964. After the marriage broke up, Jorgensen gave up custody. Jackie remarried Mike Bezos, who adopted Jeff and raised him as his own. Have you ever regretted that decision? Big mistake. But at the time, I thought it was the best. Jorgensen opened a bike shop and toiled away in obscurity for the next 40 years. Ted Jorgensen was working in his bike shop here in Phoenix, Arizona, when a biographer writing a book about Jeff Bezos came in with news that would change Ted's life forever. When the writer came in and told you that your son was Jeff Bezos. What was your reaction? He asked me if I knew who Jeff Bezos was. And what did you say? I said, uh, no, the name kind of sounds familiar, but I don't know. Jorgensen lives in this modest house in a middle-class Phoenix suburb, a far cry from Bezos' lakefront mansion in Seattle. Forbes magazine lists Bezos as America's 12th richest man, worth an estimated $27 billion. $27 billion, you know, with a B. Jorgensen's second wife of 26 years, Linda, says because Bezos is so rich and powerful, contacting him is difficult. Because of who Jeff is, it, I think it's made an obstacle that wouldn't have been there had he been a garbage collector. Bezos has made only one comment about his biological father. I've never met him. The only time I ever think about it is when a doctor asks me to fill out a form. 
Jorgensen is battling emphysema. He says he wants to see his son one last time before he dies. He says he doesn't want a penny from his son and just wants to apologize for what he calls the biggest mistake of his life. What would you say to him? I just feel like the, tell him I used to change your diapers, you know. <laughs> uh, and just see him, you know, shake his hand and tell him he's really done a good job with his life. She dusts, vacuums, and mops the floor. But Maureen Ebel wasn't tidying up her home. She had to get a job cleaning another person's home after she says she lost her entire multi-million dollar life savings in Bernard Madoff's alleged Ponzi scam. How dare you? What you have done is an abomination on the human race. Before the Madoff scandal broke, Maureen was living a very comfortable life. Her husband, a prominent doctor, died eight years ago and left her with a huge fortune that included homes in Pennsylvania and Florida. No one gave us anything. We earned every penny ourselves. A relative suggested she invest the money with Madoff. Two million. Maureen gave me a glimpse of her portfolio he set up for her. Pfizer, $138,000. PepsiCo Incorporated, $108,000. Coca-Cola Company, $108,000. It sounded like rock-solid investments in blue chip companies. Then, last December, Maureen was in her home in Wellington, Florida, when she heard the shocking news of Madoff's arrest. Maureen's entire portfolio, over $5 million, all invested with Madoff, wasn't worth the paper it was written on. My life savings is gone. Her finances in ruins. The 60-year-old widow put shame aside and was determined to survive. $11 change. She worked a cash register at a concession stand. Then a neighbor offered her a job cleaning her home, and she jumped at it. I wasn't born wealthy, and I know how to work. So the once well-to-do woman found herself working as a maid at the house where she had been a welcomed guest, vacuuming the rug, cleaning the mirrors, and mopping the floor. Maureen was also forced to sell her Florida home, but walked away with almost nothing. It's very hard to leave. We were there as she left for the last time. It's all gone. Maureen has now moved back full time to Pennsylvania, where she's landed a small office job, earning just enough to cover her mortgage. I'm very, very worried about it. Maureen says she sold her furniture, paintings, even her jewelry, and yet she's still struggling to hold on to this house outside of Philadelphia. I've put the word out to all my friends that I would do any type of errands uh, that they wanted done. So for a little extra money, Maureen agreed to wash her boss's car. Maureen says there's no job beneath her. As for Bernie Madoff, she only hopes he spends the rest of his life in jail. There would be a line of thousands of us slamming the cell door closed on Bernard Madoff. It's the stunning ending to the most acclaimed show on television. The shocking cut to black right in the middle of the climactic scene. I was left feeling empty. It was like a cheap one night stand. <laughs> the morning shows were buzzing with speculation. Did the finale work or was it a total cheat? It was not the ending a lot of people expected. Right. Everyone in the nation's like, what the? <laughs> The controversy is even making front page news. The New York Times weighed in with a positive review, but the New York Post says Tony and gang whack fans. It was crazy. It seemed as if your TV had gone on the fritz just when you were going to get the payoff of this show that's as great as any drama in the history of television. And many fans are feeling nothing but outrage. I thought my cable went out. And then all the credits, I was like, that's ah, horrible. That was just such a bad ending. I thought the ending was horrible. It, it didn't answer any questions. So what did that abrupt ending really mean? Was Tony Soprano, played by actor James Gandolfini, really rubbed out as he ate onion rings with his wife and son? Check out this clue from a scene that ran earlier this season. Listen as Tony Soprano's brother-in-law muses about being whacked. You probably don't even hear it when it happens, right? And that might be the final word for those who watched the last scene of the most celebrated show of our time. You couldn't believe it was happening. 
he became part of TV history in the climactic scene of The Sopranos finale. Now, Inside Edition has tracked down that nameless extra. Paolo Calandrea is 47 years old and owns this pizza joint in Pendle, Pennsylvania. He was discovered by casting agent Eileen DeNoboli, who was sitting in that pizza parlor when she got an email that the show was looking for an Italian-looking actor between 30 and 50 years old. It sort of clicked at the instantaneous moment while I was sitting here, would you want to do this? And you know, and he loved it. He was so up for the challenge. Calandrea, who was born in Italy, became part of TV history here at Holston's Old Fashioned Ice Cream Parlor in Bloomfield, New Jersey. Wearing a members only jacket, he sits at the counter and ominously eyes Tony Soprano, played by James Gandolfini. The stranger in the members only jacket was sitting right here. Tony, Carmela, and AJ were sitting in this booth right here eating their onion rings. The stranger walked by the booth and into the bathroom. What happened next is up to the viewer to interpret. So after that controversial cut to black that abruptly ended the show, was Tony whacked by the pizza guy's character? I'm not telling, I'm not telling. There could be clues to Tony's fate in The Godfather. After all, The Sopranos climax echoes the legendary scene when Al Pacino enters the restaurant bathroom and comes out blowing away his father's enemies. What'd you think about the ending? It's Johnny Sachs. How you doing? <laughs> I caught up with Sopranos star Vince Corotola, his character, New York mob boss Johnny Sack, died from cancer in one of the final episodes. Oh, this fellow that he keeps staring at right. probably killed him. You think? I think so. So what really happens to Tony? I feel he was killed at that moment, yeah. Mm. I do. I remember driving down the street one day and I get a phone call from Ryan and he's like, it's Ryan Seacrest. And I'm like, it is not. It so is not. He's like, no, this it's Ryan. And I'm like, hey, Ryan, how you doing? And he goes, this show is going to be great. We're on board. Let's go. And that was it. That's all that we you know, had to hear. And we were so excited. Yeah, because you have a great group of people around you. And every single person on our crew is delicious. They're fabulous. So every day, it's like really fun to get up and start working. It's fun. And it's not working. It's our life. I think it's a great story about a big family. We have 10 kids, so there's, you know, 12 of us, basically. And when you have 10 kids, you have their friends and their friends and celebrations and parties and a lot of drama and a lot of, you know, bickering going on and just the everyday craziness of trying to manage the stores and I manage my husband and I manage Kim and, you know, uh, uh, taking care of my family, and it's, you know, nutty. Yeah. I'm so into sequins. I was a little more hesitant about it just because I have a really crazy personality, and I don't know how that could come across, but I think it's really fun, and I love doing it with my family. I would never have done it if it wasn't with my sisters, but I think it's gonna be really fun, and I don't know, we just kinda stick together, and we try not to let Everyone's gonna have an opinion. I try not to let that bother me. We're having fun and enjoying what we're doing, so. I think that's probably one of the main reasons I decided to do this show, because we get up every day, we're at the store, we have little sisters that we take to school, we're always, you know, running around. Our lifestyles are nonstop. And the party part is just, you know, the fun part at the end of the day, and we always go out together. So it's kind of cool for people that think that of us, and to see that we really do have jobs, we really have so many things going on, not just the store, we're launching our website, we're starting a clothing line, you know, she has two stores, probably gonna open up another store, we have aspirations of opening up a men's store, there's so much going on. I was cut off when I graduated college and my dad was like, you need to get a job and like, you have a month, I'll help you find one, but then like you have to, you know, make money and support yourself. I just think that it's actually probably harder. We did grow up with this privileged life, but knowing that at a certain age we're gonna be cut off and we can't ask our parents for anything, and already having that lifestyle growing up, we wanna maintain that, so it's probably even harder for us because a lot of people are doing nothing. And we were taught at a very young age that we're gonna to have to work and we're gonna to have to fend for ourselves and whatever lifestyle we want, we have to make that on our own. So we wanted to keep that up and we've done what we could and we've all worked since we were about 16 years old. We had a lot of respect for our parents and they had a lot of respect for us. And I think that's also a reason why none of us are really rebellious. We could talk to them about anything. 
because they respected anything we've said or any of our opinions or concerns. I think that's really important to hold your children in a high level of respect, just like I said that would hold in them. We, we high also had, five! We also <laughs> had different like morals, like Saturday nights, we couldn't sleep out at our friend's house, we had to get up and go to church with our parents. Not a lot of kids were going to church. Like We had to go to church every Sunday. Everything was about family. We're very family oriented, and I think that's <clears> also why you were saying why none of us have really gone to the direction of other people. I think because we're so close to one another, and if one of us ever gets a little crazy, we have someone else say, come back, go to the shallow end. <laughs> <laughs> nice analogy. <laughs> Don't go to the deep end, Kim. Come back. I'll try. I love the big collar. It's like so Burberry yeah. style. That's cool. Yeah. Come on. Come I think that the common denominator in our family is a lot of love. We're a really close family. We spend a lot of time together, but we also make our own mistakes. I mean, we're not perfect for sure. You know, so there's a lot of things that we do that, you know, maybe, you know, because we're sort of new to that, you know, media scene that, uh, you know, you just haven't heard about yet. But I think that um, for the most part, um, you know, they're good kids. And, um, you know, we're just doing the best we can. Do you ever fight over guys or do you guys have different no, tastes? We no. We have such different tastes in guys. But we're, we're not, never. like, jealous of each other. We don't fight over, like, competition. We're not, we're not competitive never. sisters. We just fight over, like, clothes or, car. I don't know, like, really, like, like, I want to go here things. and you, like, just the stupidest Like, the things. dumb, it doesn't mean anything. I want to try it. Kim is adorable. She's a really sweet girl inside and out. She um, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't do drugs, doesn't really do all that, but you don't judge a book by its cover. She's everybody's designated driver. So Kim is the one who kind of watches out for her sisters, you know, and the rest of us, you know, and she's, she works hard. She goes home, she, get, she gets into bed, and she's up the next morning at 6 o'clock. So she definitely knows what it's like to put the hours in at work and still have a fun party life. I mean, she loves to go out with her friends, and she loves to go to the different, you know, hot Hollywood places. She's 26 years old, you know, so she has a good time, but I don't think she overdoes it, at least not yet. Kim is like over the top glamorous. I think she's like a diva, but not like a, like a, I can't, can I say but like, not like, a, you know, not like a witchy diva. She just likes like the best things in life. And it's, I think it's amazing because she's always dressed up, always like Zsa Zsa, always has to make an entrance, late Kim for everything. Is a she definitely is a princess, but she's so sweet. I like that. Um, <laughs> I don't know, she has like the biggest heart, always really sweet. Sometimes she can be a little yeah. witchy, but it, it it's not really, it doesn't last it's long. Like Courtney is kind of like emotionally cold, <laughs> but she like is really sweet and like means well and stuff, but she just like, if you want to talk to her about a boyfriend problem, she just doesn't care because she doesn't have them. So she like doesn't, she just doesn't think things are like a big deal. Like, I'll be like, oh my God, should I check his messages, da 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 And she'll just be like, you're crazy. Like, but Courtney's like really fun and like, she like doesn't care about like. She's not judgmental, which is always really good. And like, Chloe will like throw me over her shoulder and like aggressive. run me down the street. Uh, oh, I think I should get this, Chloe, don't you? What? Yeah, that is cute. I have it. This? I got that, I love it. But what do you think about all the attention that's been put on your behind? On my butt? Um, I think it's funny. You have to laugh about it. You know, I've always been curvy. I've never been one to think that stick skinny is attractive. So I embrace it. I'm Courtney. happy with myself. I think Courtney <laughs> loves being tiny and petite. She used to have a butt and then she like was really tiny. You like lost a lot of weight. I feel like I have a butt. She still has a butt. No, you do. But um, Chloe has I think we're all too. happy and like I think we all fit like how we are and like our personalities almost like fit what we look like too. I went there today. No way. Bible. For lunch? I didn't eat. Why? I'm like been nauseous. Who did you go with? Rome. Are you pregnant? No. <laughs> what do you fight about? Everything. We fight but like but one I will call later. them like I could be like you fat and then like we never say you're sorry 
And we're like, oh my god, do you want to go to the Us Weekly party? (laughs) We don't apologize. That's what sisters, it's like, I can never call one of my girlfriends a (laughs) She'd be like, like, never talk to me again. It's easy, like we could leave each other at a club and like no one cares. You're like, whatever, I'll figure it out. I think we're all really judgmental of ourselves yeah. when we Which see each other. Which everyone is, yeah. I feel like. Like, cause when I see Cord, I'm like, you look gorgeous. And then she'll be like, my nose, and I didn't see it. And she, you don't really complain about your nose. Oh my God, that, she that called much. me the no, whole I don't. day talking about my nose is so wide, I need to contour it. When? <laughs> On your way home when you were in mom's car, when mom drove I you home. I did? Yes. <laughs> With more than 100 million clips being downloaded daily, YouTube.com is making celebrities out of regular people. The most popular video of all time is the evolution of dance with 33 million downloads to date. I don't think I realized that YouTube would be as huge as it's become, but I knew it was going to be something. Um, this is where everyone was going and it just, from the very beginning, it was this amazing thing. We're like, oh my goodness, look at, look at this video from all over the world. But the biggest winners are certainly these guys, YouTube youthful founders Steve Chen and Chad Hurley. They started the company last year and just sold it to Google for a whopping $1.65 billion. So it was quite appropriate that Chad and Steve broke the news on their website. Today we have some exciting news for you. We've been acquired by Google. YouTube's international fame is for wacky videos like this one. Watch as a man piles on dozens and dozens of t-shirts. 6X, no problem. The man on the mission is Matt McAllister, a DJ from Santa Barbara, California. Matt wore a total of 155 t-shirts. The total load weighed more than 100 pounds. No, I can do that. I mean, I can't do most of the stuff that people are in the Guinness Book of World Records for, but I could do that. So how do you get a clip on YouTube? It's actually pretty easy. All you need is a video camera or a video phone, a computer, and a YouTube account. I've decided to upload this video of myself giving a tour of our newsroom. They came to me and said, listen, there's this new thing, YouTube. We want you to show people how to make a video, how to upload it. So I'm explaining this to to people. I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen with it or anyone was going to actually see it. Um, But it it was foreign to me. It was the first time I'd ever done it. Now, it's so simple. I mean, you just go to your phone and you pull up the YouTube app and, and you know, bada bing, bada boom. Back then, I'm talking about how you have to, you know, either use a, I said a video phone back then, I think, and that's, everyone's got a video now, or a camera. Nobody uses a camera anymore. And I think even back then, you had to plug it in from here to the computer. And before you know it, here I am for all of you and me to see. Now, let's wait to see if I become a viral video hit. We can only say thank you. It's, it it is, I I love this show. I love the stories that we put together. I love the stories that our digital unit puts together. And YouTube is such a perfect platform for it. And, And we're just glad that you found us.